lectures on the nature of science. So the study is entitled Maltese Post-Secondary Lectures Views on the Nature of Science. And basically the aim of the study, how do I present her? The main aim of the study basically was to investigate the nature of science views of post-secondary lectures in Malta. Now, NOS doesn't stand for no service, it stands for nature of science. And basically the study was carried out with post-secondary lectures who taught part-time or full-time in either of the following institutions, the University of Malta, the Malta College of Arts, Science and Technology, and all the sixth forms in Malta, that is church, state, and independent sixth forms. Now, when we say post-secondary lectures, we are referring to 16 plus compulsory formal education in Malta, basically. And the lecturers that took part in the study, they either taught science, a science-related area, and or theology, philosophy, religious knowledge. Basically, we chose philosophy, religious knowledge, or theology because of the nature, because we were um, studying the nature of science, and we thought they would make an interesting contribution, basically, to this uh, study. The views of these lectures then were compared by age bracket, by lecturing experience, by area of specialization, by closest traditional science area, that is whether it was chemistry, biology or physics for the science lecturers, by gender and by highest qualification, this is whether they had a bachelor's, a master's or a PhD. The study utilized a mixed methods approach. Now, as the quantitative data, we had a ready-made questionnaire, namely the student understanding of science and scientific inquiry, developed by Liang, Shan, Shan, Kaya, Adams, Macklin, and the Benedier, and it was distributed to a total of 1,403 lecturers, out of which um, we collected 252 responses, yielding a margin of error of 5.59% at 95% confidence interval. Eventually, as qualitative data, we carried out 10 interviews with various lecturers teaching in various institutions in various areas, basically, um, in Malta. Now, what is the nature of science? A widely accepted definition of the nature of science and OS and the SI scientific inquiry, which was utilized in this study, is that um, they are the epistemology of science, the way of knowing in science, the values and beliefs inherent to scientific knowledge and its development. Now, um, for the purpose of this study, the questionnaire divided the nature of science into six aspects. And I will be explaining what was considered as the adequate view um, by the authors of the questionnaire on each of these components. Now, the first component over here, observations and inferences, what was considered as an adequate view was that observations and inferences are usually subjective um, to the scientists' values and beliefs, etc. Change of scientific theories, scientific theories change, they change in light of new evidence, all right? And they change by the reinterpretation of existing evidence, scientific laws versus scientific theories. I don't know um, whether you know what scientific laws um, basically have a mathematical basis usually, but scientific theories, they derive um, knowledge from various areas and they are like an umbrella term, like for example, the theory of evolution, it gets, um, knowledge from DNA biology and knowledge from anatomy, for example, knowledge from morphology, and it encapsulates all the, all the evidence, basically like an umbrella term on all these sciences. The social and cultural influence of science, that is that society and culture influence science, and science ultimately influences society and culture. Um, imagination and creativity in science, that imagination and creativity are used throughout um, all scientific investigation and methodology and scientific investigation. The adequate view, once again, I'm just describing the adequate view, what was considered as an adequate view. Um, the methods um, that sci science basically uses, uses various um, methods to develop new scientific knowledge. Now, how were the questions? Each of these six, um, sorry. Each of these six was analyzed using, um, using this question. So there were four Likert statements on each of these. I'm trying to. There were four Likert statements on each of these and an open question. For example, this one, 
these are the four Likert statements for observations and inferences. And then basically, they have to indicate whether they strongly disagree, disagree, or uncertain, agree, or strongly agree with each statement, and then explain um, the view um, that they, they expressed in the corresponding Likert statements. How are these analyzed? Initially, I analyzed them by numbering them such that um, the higher the, uh, the mean, the higher the mean basically of these four, because I analyzed every component individually, um, the more adequate would be the view of the participant. And then I analyzed the individual Likert -like statements where a score of one or two indicated an inadequate view, a score of three indicated an intermediate or transitional view, and a score of four or five indicated an adequate view. All components basically um, had a skewed distribution to the right because they are Likert -like statements, so we applied the cross Carl wallis test to compare the various subgroups. Okay. Um, a large number of open responses were, were actually obtained. So these were classified based on the rubric developed by the authors of the questionnaire. As inadequate, they were given the inadequate views, a score of one, intermediate, a score of two, adequate, a score of three, and the unclassifiable, a score of zero. And then we compared using the candle stau b test, the, the open questions, the responses of the open questions with the responses of the closed questions, basically. Um, the interviews then were analyzed in two ways. Initially, I read the interviews, each interview in detail, then I identified codes and the margins. Eventually, I merged these codes into coding frames, many times hierarchical, and then I emerged the teams. So that was the first analysis on a clean slate, so to speak. Eventually, I analyzed them using the rubric of the open responses. So I would better align the qualitative data with the quantitative data, okay? Now, the results. Um, when I analyzed all the Likert statements together, so we're saying 24 Likert statements because four statements on each component. When we analyze them together, these are the views of Maltese post-secondary lecturers. So 1.6% had inadequate views on the nature of science, 40.5% had intermediate views, 57.9% had adequate views. Clearly shows um, that most of them had adequate views. When looking at the mean scores for each component, over there you can see the percentages um, of adequate views on each of the components. So change of scientific theory is 87.7%, scientific methodology 73%, social and cultural influence on science 68.7%, imagination and creativity 66.3%, observations and inferences 62.7%. So we're saying that five of the components of the nature of science had higher than 60% adequate views. But when looking at the distinction between scientific laws and theories, there were only 21% that got adequate views. And when looking at the open questions, there was agreement, according to the candle tau B test, there was agreement between the open responses and the closed responses. Um, but usually the open questions show the higher percentage of intermediate views. The reason was that the rubric of the questionnaire was quite stringent. Um, so, for example, to be um, considered as an adequate view, they had to mention both the subjectivity of inferences and the subjectivity of observations. Um, they had to mention, for example, that scientific theories change um, both um, by new evidence and new instruments and also by the reinterpretation of existing evidence. But as you can see, the outcome over here is that scientific laws versus theories show um, a low percentage of adequate views. Generally, interview data presented these findings. In fact, over here, you can see participant number four, change of scientific theories, and a theory can be challenged by new data coming up, by new approaches being tested. And also, I'm not going to bore you with reading this, um, imagination and creativity, participant 10, that is also describing an adequate view on imagination and creativity. Um, generally, interview data, again, presented these findings for scientific laws versus theories. The problem with scientific laws versus theories many times is um, that there, is, there tends to be this idea that there is a hierarchical relationship between a scientific theory and the scientific law, um, or that laws eventually develop into theories, while in reality, they are two different um, forms of knowledge. So over here, you can see, as you move from hypothesis to theory to law, the level of certainty increases. That was considered as an inadequate view. And I believe that a law is more sure than a theory, because I think even in general laws are, everyone has to abide by the laws. And as you can see, um, when we speak of 
scientific laws, we tend to go to how laws are used in, in society in general. I mean, no one is above the law, so to speak. And that connotation tends to give the idea of absoluteness, of sureness of scientific laws. I mean, I'm not saying they're not sure, but even Newton's laws within certain parameters, they, they don't apply. And there was once um, the law of periodicity that eventually it, it had to change. So um, when comparing, when seeing the variation in the different subgroups, variation by age group and lecturing experience yielded no significant difference on any of the components. Variation by gender yielded a significant difference um, where males exhibited better views than females. However, when comparing to other studies and also when looking at the interview data, it was not corroborated. So basically, um, the results were considered inconclusive. Now, um, I will be showing these types of graphs. I would like you to um, understand them. So over here, there are the six components. And those are, I mean, the values are very small, but probably you can see them. Um, those are the means. Um, as you can see, the colors correspond. Um, so for example, the blue one is for observations and inferences that correspond with observations and inferences. Then change of scientific theories. So that is change of scientific theories. Um, and the other scientific laws versus theories, etc. All the six components basically um, compared for pure science, for applied science, and for humanities. Now, post-secondary lecturers to arrive to their current lecturing position, they might have had different pathways. So, for example, someone who studied engineering might be teaching, um, which is considered an applied science. Uh, might be teaching pure science. So it was very difficult to come up with a way to distinguish between them. So we left it up to the lecturer to decide whether um, his specialization is pure science, applied science, or humanities. So that might limit a bit, um, so to speak, the generalization of, of these findings. Now, um, this graph basically, um, to come up with the statistical differences, I did this table over here. You can see the components. And as you can see, if you look at the means, the means for applied science are lower when compared to pure science and humanities on five of the components, with the difference being statistically significant on change on scientific theories and imagination and creativity in scientific investigation. Over there, um, a mean of 3.83 and a mean of 3.48. And this shows that applied science lecturers tend to have um, less adequate views when compared to pure science and humanities lecture, lecturers on the nature of science. Um, variation by area of specialization. Um, once again, this was attributed um, why applied science lecturers had less adequate views was attributed to lack of prayer reflection. Why lack of prayer reflection? Because applied science lecturers tend to focus more on the practical aspect of science rather than the epistemological underpinnings, basically, um, of the knowledge being developed. In fact, it was also corroborated by a study carried out by Eretz um, in 2006. Um, this is variation by closest traditional science area. Again, the same type of graph, the same error bar graph, six components over here, um, comparing biology, chemistry, and physics. To see them a bit in more detail, if you had to compare biology, chemistry, and physics, you can see that the means for, um, of course, over here we're seeing the science post-secondary lecturers. For those that um, had physics as their area of specialization, that they had um, less adequate views when compared to chemistry and biology lecturers on four of the components, um, with the difference being statistically significant on change of scientific theories, social and cultural influence on science, with a mean of 3.75 and 3.48. And this was attributed to the mathematical basis of physics, which tends to, to give a certain sense of absoluteness, a certain a sense of certainty, um, so to speak. In fact, um, even during the interviews, when discussing, for example, um, social and cultural influence and political influence on science, physics lecturers tend to mention examples from chemistry and biology rather than from physics. So they agreed, um, basically, that there is a social and cultural influence, but they tended to mention examples from other areas of, of science, of traditional science. Um, over here, this is the uh, this is the graph showing um, variation by highest qualification. These are the six components again, comparing bachelor's, master's, and PhD. 
Now, what was interesting, that if we look at the means, you can see that there is progress. So um, the means progress from bachelor's to master's to PhD on four of the components. So the views tend to improve, so to speak, as you go from bachelor's to master's to PhD. And it was statistically significant on the ideas of change of scientific theories. So as you can see, 3.72 to 3.92 to 4.11. 2.76 to 2.88 to 2.90. Okay, um, so so basically there was an improvement with um, the views being statistically significant on change of scientific theories. This also came out during the interviews where two of the post secondary lecturers mentioned their PhD and how defending um, basically their doctoral thesis helped to contribute to their nature of science views because the artistic aspect comes in because the philosophical aspect um, comes in. It was concluded ultimately that a higher qualification um, leads to more exposure to research, its subjective and creative nature and the philosophical aspect of science that comes in when one is defending his or her doctoral thesis and this contributes basically to nature of science views. What are the conclusions? The study shows that most post-secondary lectures held adequate views on most nature of science components, which shows um, that we are in the right direction, so to speak. Um, also, when viewing the results for scientific laws versus theories, post-secondary lecturers tended to have inadequate views on this component. And this was similar to other studies, um, local studies with undergraduates and teachers, and also um, other studies on an international level. Considering this, as Wang and Hudson put it, one starts to question the use of the term law and science, as this tends to give a false sense of, of certainty because of the way the term law is used in society in general. And also a greater nature of science component should be incorporated in applied science courses as ultimately both lecturers and their students may occupy positions where it is good to have proper scientific literacy and proper understanding of the nature of science as a, as a discipline and um, basically how this relates also to, to other disciplines. So that was the conclusion. Um, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Um, there is a study with undergraduates, there is a study with science teachers locally, on an international level there are much more studies, I mean even with kindergartners on their nature of science groups. Yes. I mean, and activities to improve their views eventually, because um, there is quite um, a good number of studies where um, they study the views that the students have, then they do a course um, to try to improve their views, and then they do a post-test um, to see whether their views improved or not, on an international level, but um, in Malta there is no such study yet. And an open question. How did you treat the open questions? You said that um, are they included in the numbers you showed up? No, in the numbers I, I showed you no, because um, I used um, the rubric basically to classify them as adequate, intermediate and inadequate. And then I used the candle tau to see, um, to compare them. But in the actual dissertation, I included the frequencies, etc. But in the numbers I showed you here, no, because I had to merge everything together. <laughs>